Ready? How y'all doing? I'm the last man standing. Sorry, it really sucks to be the only person standing between you and happy hour. Uh, let's stretch. Don't get up. Just lift your arms up. Stretch for just a second. We're 11 minutes away from being done. Okay. Let's get serious for a minute. I believe we are in actually the early stages of this phenomenon that we call globalization. And if you look at the data, it's quite clear over the last 20 to 30 years, the lowering of trade barriers around the world has led to a dramatic increase in trade. And with increased trade has come economic growth. And we've seen all kinds of wealth created, even in some of the poorest countries in the world. So you look at those numbers and you conclude, hey, globalization is working, right? Well, actually, no. Uh, many of those same studies coming out of UN, World Bank, and other agencies are demonstrating very clearly that the benefits of globalization are simply not trickling down to the poorest of the poor. In fact, literally billions of people are being left behind by this economic growth that's being created. And I'm sure you've all seen the numbers, right? I mean, we know that two billion people in the world today are trying to survive on two bucks a day. You can't survive on two dollars a day. I, I travel all the time. I, I'm in rural communities in Africa and Asia and Latin America on a regular basis and I see this reality. Farming families that are struggling just to put food on the table. Many of them can't send their kids to school at all or if they do it's to third grade and then the kids are in the fields. Don't have access to clean drinking water, don't have access to health care, Infant mortality is high, life expectancy is low. And that's just the social side of the story, right? I mean, we know that we don't have a handle on climate change yet. We haven't been able to stop deforestation. So the world's on fire. And you know, my question for everyone in this room is, what are we going to do about it? I mean, it, it seems to me that that is our common challenge. What are we going to do about it individually and as a movement? And we don't have much time. And I would argue that the old approaches have proven themselves ineffective, right? Government intervention, government regulation, uh, international development aid, well-intentioned NGOs. I mean, it's not getting the problem solved. I actually believe that, you know, th this emerging group of social entrepreneurs that are using market-based approaches um, are onto something. I think that we have to find ways to use the market and the power of companies and consumers um, to bring to the task of more scalable and effective solutions. And uh, I work on fair trade, and that's obviously one of many different um, models in this emerging field of market-based approaches to poverty and sustainability. So a quick personal story. I got started in, in fair trade and in international development fresh out of college, so studied economics, was concerned about poverty and hunger, wanted to be involved in international development. In the summer of 1983, I decided I was going to go work with farmers. So I bought a one-way ticket to Nicaragua, as my buddy Jerry well knows, and uh, started working with farmers. Thought I would stay for a year or two, get some field experience, and then do something sensible. And I fell in love with the place. Uh, I stayed for 11 years and um, spent the first part of that time working on um, one international development project after another. Uh, kind of typical of this classic paradigm uh, that we've had since World War II of poverty alleviation in the developing world. So very well-intentioned people sitting in foundation offices and in bilateral and multilateral institutions, dreaming up projects and sending millions and millions of dollars of well-intentioned development aid to alleviate poverty. And it, it doesn't work. I mean, the projects that I worked on, without exception, failed. And I would argue they failed because we didn't figure out how to develop people's own capacity to solve their own problems. In fact, more often than not, I would say we just recreated dependency on aid. And yet, farmers don't want our charity, right? I, mean, I never met a farmer that wanted charity. They just want a decent return for all the hard work and for the harvest that they produce. 
So I became disillusioned and, and, and totally disaffected with the scene and was about to bail on the country and totally by accident heard about these crazy people in Europe that called themselves fair traders and who were offering us a dramatically higher price for our products if we could just get our farmers organized and sell direct. I was working with coffee farmers at the time. That first year, I only got 24 brave souls to sign up. And we filled one container of coffee. We shipped it to Europe. We got $1.26 per pound for our coffee at a time when the local market price was 10 cents a pound. Now, most of these farmers were, were like one-acre farmers, so they produced roughly 2,000 pounds of coffee each per year, right? So they would have made 200 bucks total cash income for the year. Instead, they made 2,000 bucks. And that was the driver of this whole movement that over the next three years allowed us to organize 3,000 families throughout northern Nicaragua. We were milling and processing our own coffee. We were exporting direct, and by virtue of the dramatically higher income, Farmers were rebuilding their homes. They were bringing electricity into their villages for the first time. They were bringing clean drinking water into their villages for the first time. They were doing things for themselves that, you know, otherwise they would have waited for government or agencies to come in and do for them. They were doing it for themselves. We set up um, scholarship funds because, you know, to go to high school was like 150 bucks a year between bus money and uniform money. You know, 150 bucks a year for a poor farming family was prohibitive. We set up scholarship funds so that kids could go to high school. My buddy uh, Santiago Rivera in Somoto, his daughter Yolanda was the first girl in their entire village to ever graduate from high school, thanks to one of these scholarship funds set up with fair trade premiums. And last year she graduated from college and she's working in the health sector, she's back in the community, and she's this amazing role model for all the girls in that village of hope and of dreams that, that can come true, of something better. So that's what fair trade is all about. And you know, as you can guess, it, that experience, that journey was deeply transformative for all of them. Um, you know, this amazing development process that wasn't driven by anyone's charity, but was just driven by this simple, powerful concept of a, of, a, of a fair price for a great product. So that changed my life too, and it led me to come back to the States and, and launch Fair Trade USA. And, um, in 12 years, we built the fair trade market here in the U.S. into a $1.2 billion market. Um, so, you know, roughly a million farmers around the world now meet that fair trade standard for social and environmental criteria. They get inspected and certified every year, much like an organic inspection. And that allows them to sell to fair trade buyers anywhere in the world. On this side of the market, we have 800, more than 800 companies that are now buying direct, paying a better price. And for the farmers, what it means is better income and, and, a, and, and a vehicle through this direct market linkage of rising out of poverty based on their own efforts. But there's something in it for the companies too, right? I mean, the companies are finding that this model and similar models are helping them stabilize their supply chain, which is top of everyone's list these days, right? Stabilize the supply chain, improve reputation, right? and also tap into this growing consumer segment that we call the conscious consumer segment of enlightened consumers that are looking for great products that also are kind of consistent with our values, right? Great products that also make us feel good. So I would argue that what these companies are proving is that globalization itself is in a process of evolution. If the old version of globalization pitted profitability against sustainability, right? So to the extent that you were sustainable and responsible and cared about, you know, the workers and farmers in your supply chain, you were less profitable and vice versa, right? What some have characterized as the race to the bottom. I would argue that the new version of, of globalization that's emerging and growing very rapidly is this notion that so many companies have embraced that you can actually be profitable and sustainable at the same time. That, there, that that conflict can be eliminated and in fact that you can use sustainability and corporate social responsibility as a tool for growth and profitability. And that's what's so exciting, right? Because if we can, if we can make doing the right thing profitable for corporate America, then we've hitched ourselves to the, the most powerful horse around. Um, you know, I came up here 
uh, when I moved back from Nicaragua, I thought fair trade was all about and only about farmer empowerment. And what I've learned over the last decade is that this model and other models of sustainability are just as much about our empowerment, about our journey, as it is about theirs. Right? I mean, I, I know that everyone in this room cares. And I believe that most Americans care. I don't believe that most Americans want to eat a bar of chocolate if they knew that there was child labor in the production of that cocoa. I don't believe that people want to eat bananas knowing that farm workers were, were sprayed with pesticides in the process, right? We want products that are consistent with our values, with our own ideals. The problem is Americans don't know how to get involved. We don't think our voice is heard. I mean, half the country doesn't even vote. What more proof do you want than that? But we all eat, right? We all wear clothes, except for some people in Berkeley that live down the street from me. <laughs> right? So if you can turn the act of consumption, food and clothing and things that we all use, if we can turn that into an act of grace and goodwill, then we've really, we're really on to something. Right? I mean, if, if with something as simple and easy as a daily cup of coffee, or a cup of tea, or a banana, you can reach halfway across the world and help a family keep their kids in school. That's incredibly empowering. And I would argue that is, it, it's that simple pow but powerful notion that is driving this surge of, of interest in fair trade and organics and local and all these other concepts that ultimately are the best expression that I have of a popular movement toward a sustainable society. I just want to finish by saying that, you know, for me, if, if a key to our survival as a planet is awakening ourselves to our ability to vote with our dollars for a better world, then universities are at the cutting edge. Universities are the vanguard of that. Right? For the last 10 years, we've seen university uh, students all over the country campaign to get fair trade coffee into their dining halls. And now we're seeing that whole movement expand, going beyond coffee with tea and bananas and other products and apparel. We, we just started certifying fair trade apparel. We're putting more money back in the pockets of seamstresses and garment factories around the world. And so we're seeing this, what we call the fair trade universities phenomenon, grow dramatically. Getting fair trade products on campus, getting fair trade and, other, and, and similar approaches into the curriculum, and really using this environment as a way to show industry what's coming. So my call to action, if you're a student or professor, get a fair trade university campus going. <laughs> And for everyone, think about what you buy. When you drink that cup of coffee, think about the family in, in the bottom of the cup. Just the act of awakening ourselves to a more mindful level of consumption begins this process. Ask for it when you go to the cafe next time. Ask for it at the supermarket. Corporate America is listening and the power is in our hands. Thank you.